In this video, I'll show you how to make your Raspberry Pi run faster. Yeah, well, that's not exactly what I meant. The idea here, is that depending on how you set up your Raspberry Pi, you can speed it up and make it two to three times faster for some tasks. This is especially important if you are using it for desktop usage, but can also be interesting for other usages. I will give you several tips later in this video. But first, let me show you the differences. On the left, a traditional setup, and on the right the optimized version I tested. Same Raspberry Pi model, same OS, but I'm already saving more than 10 seconds on the time to boot. But you'll notice the same kind of improvements with most apps. Browsing YouTube would be less annoying, with pages and thumbnails loading slightly faster. And most apps you will use might start a bit faster with the optimized version. It depends on the time the app takes to load by default, and the reason why they are slow. Maybe you won't notice any major difference for some of them, like LibreOffice, even if there is a small difference. That's why not all the tips I will give you are not mandatory, it really depends on how you use your Raspberry Pi. But on apps that are already slow to start up, like Scratch, the difference is pretty dramatic with almost 30 seconds saved on the optimized version. It loads in 60 seconds on a default setup, and 33 seconds on my optimized version. That's why I told you that for desktop usage, these tips are pretty important. You'll save time with each app you start, and then while using them most tasks would be faster too. A few moments later. I also did various tests with suspension with other apps, like the time to unzip the Raspberry Pi kernel. It's not very interesting to watch, but I can tell you some differences are pretty spectacular. Overall, file operations were 3 to 5 times faster. Tests with the CPU were impressive too, with a 20x boost on the optimized version in some cases. But even memory tests were way better on the optimized version. It wasn't expected. So, what did I change exactly on this version? Here is exactly what I did. And I will also give you additional tips at the end, to get even better results. Raspberry Pi OS is now available with a 64-bit version. It's compatible with all the recent models, and you should get a slight boost from using it instead of the old 32-bit system. You shouldn't get major issues by switching from 32 to 64-bit, except the bugs that are still not fixed with Bullseye. You can find the 64-bit version of Raspberry Pi OS directly in Raspberry Pi Imager, so you should try it the next time you reinstall your system. But even if you are not using Raspberry Pi OS, most systems are now available with a 64-bit version. In fact, I guess the 32-bit versions will just disappear in the near future. For example, Ubuntu, Manjaro and OpenSUSE give you directly the link to the 64-bit version. Try these versions and see how it works for your next projects. I think that at least half the boost I got between my two versions comes from the media storage I used. In the normal version, the system was installed on a standard SD card. Not the worst one, but not the best either. On the optimized version, I was using an SSD. SSD are way faster than SD cards, and so each time your system need to read or write something on the disk, you get a slight boost in performance. You'll find all the hardware I use in the description, but I recommend the Argon 1 case for this, as you can hide your SSD inside and keep everything in a compact case. But even if you don't use an SSD, make sure you are using a good SD card, or even USB keys. There is no major difference in price between a bad and an excellent SD card, but you'll notice the difference in everyday use. I'll also link my benchmark of the most popular SD cards in the description if you want to learn more about this. This was not a factor in my comparison, as I did my tests on a brand new installation but you can quickly decrease the overall speed of your system, if you try everything I show you in my videos, and never remove them when you don't use the services anymore. You can use tools like Top to see what is taking the most resources in terms of CPU and RAM. Or a tool named Baobab, that will list the biggest files on your system. In any case, try to find what is installed, but you don't need any more, and remove the corresponding packages as soon as possible. Most apps won't necessarily slow down your system. But especially if you have services running in the background, like Apache or things like that, 
try to uninstall them if they are no longer required. Just take a few minutes regularly to make this quick audit, and you might get a nice boost. Overclocking is another thing you can try. Basically, your device is set to use a specific processor frequency and voltage to get decent performances while maximizing life expectancy. But, you can edit the configuration file on your system to try other values, and get a nice boost from it. It's particularly interesting if you use apps that rely on single-thread processes, but can help in many cases. This tip will require a complete video to give you all the details, but you'll find the values I used and how to set this up in the video description. Just remember that playing with this can have some bad consequences, like system instability, boot issues or even hardware damage. So be careful when you play with this. Especially if you are using overclocking, try to keep an eye on the processor temperature. The system will get throttled when the CPU is too hot. Starting at 80 degrees Celsius, the processor will slow down to avoid any major issue. And you can quickly get to this threshold when you use overclocking without a proper cooling system. So, keep an eye on it, either via the command line or this nice panel widget. And upgrade your cooling solution depending on the results you get. You don't necessarily need the ice tower for desktop usage, but a fan is almost mandatory when overclocking is enabled. When using an external drive or overclocking, a good power supply is mandatory. You can power a Raspberry Pi with a simple USB cable when you don't use the USB ports or PO pins, but as soon as you plug a USB drive, you will get errors. So, try to use the official power supply for your model, or at least follow the recommendations from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Not all USB chargers will work the same, they don't always deliver the same output. If you use an external hard drive, an option can also be to use a different power supply for it, so it won't slow down your Pi. I did this comparison while keeping everything on Raspberry Pi OS with the default desktop environment. But especially for desktop usage, I would recommend testing other options. I have full videos on this topic, so I will just link to them. But for example, Manjaro or Diet Pi can be great alternatives for your base system instead of Raspberry Pi OS. Also remember to try other desktop environments and maybe install another web browser for an additional boost.